Hello and good afternoon to everyone who joined us. And hello to everyone who joined us from Facebook. My name is Anasha Ekenaiker and I will be moderating the session for today. Uh, so today is the second of four workshops that we have planned for the week. And today we'll be focusing on climate and disasters management. We have an excellent lineup of speakers, uh, but before we move on to them, just a few things I would kindly request all of you all to do. So first of all, please do keep yourselves muted at all times. And second, uh, we do have some group work happening later. So in order to uh, better facilitate that, I would like to request all of you all to rename yourselves on Zoom. So have your name and country. So basically you just hover your name on Zoom under participants, click on more, and there should be an option saying to rename. And uh, finally, there is a registration form, like yesterday for those who joined, uh, just to get an understanding of who's joining the call that I have also linked on the chat. Uh, it would be great if you could fill that out. So to start off today's session, I would like to now invite Dr. Sinimal Jayatunga, the additional secretary to the Ministry of Environment of Sri Lanka, to make his address. Dr. Jayatunga. Uh, Sinasya, um, thank you very much. And good afternoon to uh, everyone, and also good morning who are joining from other part of the world. Um, first of all, um, uh, let me appreciate uh, Strike and Trust for inviting me and also giving this opportunity to speak on climate and disaster risk management uh, forum and to share the. Sri Lankan experience in, in this regard. <clears throat> uh, as you all know that um, climate change adverse impact, it's meaning it's a risk for uh, socio-economic condition of the people as well as to the environment. Sri Lanka being a tropical island in the Indian Ocean, it is highly vulnerable to adverse impact of climate change, especially um, prolonged drought situations in the dry zone and also <clears throat> uh, uh, in intensive rainfalls affected as some um, flash floods and landslides, flash floods in uh, lowland areas and um, landslide in the highland. And also um, sea level rise, though it is an um, uh, onset event, but it is um, badly affected for the for the country. So in terms of um, climate vulnerabilities, Sri Lanka is, Sri Lanka has been ranked <clears throat> uh, as the sixth uh, most vulnerable country in the world by the German watch. So uh, just a country in the world. <clears throat> so in order to identify the climate risk and also to manage the uh, the climate and the disaster risks, we know we should have to have uh, uh, to identify the risk and the vulnerability in you know, the vulnerability or the risk of adverse impact. Yeah, could you hear yes. me? Yes, Dr. Tatanga, I think um, perhaps we could, you could continue. I think you might have to turn off your video because the connection isn't very clear. Uh, may I off it? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Now it's okay? Yes. Yeah, yes. thank you. <clears throat> so um, what I was um, highlighting is that in order to identify the risk uh, of uh, climate adverse impacts, so we need to conduct uh, vulnerability assessment. In Sri Lanka, we have conducted so far three, four vulnerability assessments. The first one was conducted in 2009 and 2010, and that time we were able to identify the, the as the most vulnerable sectors, uh, five sectors. So um, afterward, uh, we have conducted the vulnerable assessment for the uh, second national communication. Also, 2016, we have conducted or even updated the vulnerable assessment we conducted in 2009 and 10. <clears throat> so the fourth vulnerability assessment uh, we conducted for the uh, third national communication. So <clears throat> the, the, the experience conducting or identifying climate risks um, 
is we have four vulnerable assessment conducted. So um, the, 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 the most challenge is how to manage the, the risk or the vulnerability uh, pertaining in uh, Sri Lanka as well as in other countries. So in order to um, minimize the risk, we, in fact, in Sri Lanka, we have prepared our national adaptation plan to be implemented between 2016 to 2025. So under this um, national adaptation plan, we have uh, incorporated many uh, adaptation measures. So those adaptation measures especially uh, helps to reduce the risk of um, the vulnerability. Uh, among those activities, if I categorize, <clears throat> um, the one thing is that we, we have identified that there are um, many strata of the society, they, they don't have the, the knowledge on uh, how to identify the vulnerability and how to identify the risk. So therefore we identified that uh, the wider spectrum of uh, awareness to be conducted to raise their knowledge on climate change. And the other part is that um, capacity building. This capacity building is one of the actions that we have identified under the national adaptation plan as well as uh, nationally determined contributions. So under the nationally determined contributions also, uh, we have already incorporated um, eight sectors to build, to, be, to build resilience to meet the adverse impact of climate change, meaning that to reduce the risk of climate change adverse impacts. So uh, cap capacity building awareness, uh, we, we identified that one of the most important elements in order to build resilience so <clears throat> to minimize risk of affecting uh, adverse impact of climate change to many sectors, many areas, many vulnerable communities. But the other one is what we identified that there is a huge gap <clears throat> of data in order to identify the real vulnerability, in order to identify the real risk. So therefore, in order to um, manage risk of climate change, so it's need to have a very, um, how to say that, well, uh, well established and well, uh, very well updated database. Without that database, it's very difficult to, to measure or very, very difficult to identify the vulnerability, whether it is increased, whether it is reduced. So this climate risk also the same. So in order to identify the climate risk or to measure the climate risk, whether it is increased, whether it is reduced. So we need to have a very sound database, uh, frequently collected database and updated database. Uh, the other part, what we identified in terms of uh, <clears throat> reducing risk of climate change and disasters. So we need to build uh, uh, cooperation between relevant stakeholders and also uh, coordination among relevant stakeholders because that is uh, in developing countries, it is one of uh, constraints as well as one of the gap that we need. Um, to uh, develop uh, or minimize uh, risk risk reduction in terms of uh, climate change uh, vulnerability and also the other disasters. Uh, what another thing what we identified that um, the, the very strong institutional setup should be built among the stakeholder institutions and also the policy strength and in terms of in terms of uh, building resilience to meet adverse impact of climate change because the the vulnerability is increasing day by day. So therefore, <clears throat> uh, identifying the most potential poli policy guidance, poli policy options, as well as very strong, very uh, very productive, very um, implementable um, 
institutional setup should be established. Those, those are the, the main, main or important elements of uh, risk reduction. And uh, in, in identifying this, um, um, uh, this uh, need that the importance of having uh, those elements. So Sri Lanka has already uh, prepared our uh, national adaptation plan as well as uh, nationally determined contributions to build resilience, to meet the adverse impact of climate change, reducing uh, disaster risk reduction. In fact, uh, this is um, very, um, uh, how to say, nutshell. So how that uh, disaster risk reduction is managed in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, you know, um, we are the national focal point to the United Nations Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. Uh, in order to um, take actions related to climate change under the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change Secretariat has been established. So climate change, the, the responsibility of the Climate Change Secretariat is <clears throat> to conduct or support or coordinate conducting uh, vulnerability assessment to uh, identify the risk of uh, climate change. And uh, also, uh, and so we have the disaster management center. So that is uh, 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 dealing with um, almost all the disasters. So the climate change secretariat and disaster management center working very closely to minimize the risk of um, disasters and climate change induced disasters. <clears throat> um, one more thing in order to manage the risk, what we identified that early warning, early warning systems to be established and also that risk transferring mechanisms to be established. So those things are at present we are implementing as well as those have been incorporated to our uh, national adaptation plan, as well as uh, nationally determined contributions and, and the, the adaptation projects which are implemented at present in the country. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if the time permits, I will take one or two minutes to say that um, we have already uh, identified the need of um, uh, establishing or preparing provincial level uh, adaptation plans. So we have already initiated um, identifying the vulnerability of um, different uh, provinces. In Sri Lanka, we have nine provinces. So we have already initiated, we have conducted series of workshops and con consultations uh, with relevant stakeholders to develop provincial adaptation plans incorporating uh, climate risk reduction actions. So thank you very much um, for giving this opportunity for me. I hope uh, I covered not all, but it is uh, uh, with the limited um, time. So I will conclude here and I take this opportunity once again. Uh, thanks to the SLIC and Trust for organizing this kind of um, information sharing sessions, because this is very much useful for the, uh, for the countries who have the experience on uh, risk reduction, uh, risk, risk management activities um, uh, undertaken to uh, build resilient to meet the adverse impact of climate change. And thank you uh, uh, very much. Thank you, Senashia, for giving this opportunity for me. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayatunga. Um, and welcome to everyone who's uh, joined us newly. Uh, just to let you know before we move on to the next presentation, kindly do fill out the registration form. I will drop the link on the chat again, just to get an understanding of uh, who's in the call. Uh, so thank you very much again, Dr. Jayatunga. Dr. Jayatunga is the additional secretary to the Ministry of Environment of Sri Lanka. I would now like to uh, travel across continents to Egypt and ask Mr. Osman, who is the head of the Global Environmental Management and Economic Sustainability Advancement Sector, uh, to uh, make his address. Uh, thank you uh, so much. 
uh, in the beginning of my uh, speech, I'd like to thank uh, Voisa and the project team for inviting me to address this important topic for our uh, developing countries. Uh, my speech will focus on the barriers for climate change adaptation and risk disaster management in Egypt. Um, uh, uh, as a background uh, for the participants, Egypt uh, landscapes, people and the economy are highly vulnerable to the ongoing impacts of climate change. Uh, on our northern border with the Mediterranean Sea, the country's Nile Delta is witnessing the climate change induced impacts of erosion inundation and salt water intrusion due to the sea level rise, uh, which impacting uh, its fertile agricultural land, coastal cities with high population density, uh, tourism industry ports and the transport networks, etc., will be impacted. Uh, national uh, development across sectors is challenged by the increasing frequency, intensity and magnitude of extreme weather events such as heat waves, uh, flash floods and heavy precipitation, as well as sand and dust storms, uh, because we have a uh, big desert around the, the Nile Valley, uh, and we consider as one of the most uh, arid countries around the world. Uh, these impacts are uh, compounding the related challenges of declining freshwater availability, a steady population growth, and rapid uh, urbanization. Uh, therefore, Egypt's ability to respond to these impacts is challenged by low technical capacity for adaptation planning and uh, limited inf information on climate risks and vulnerability. Uh, the main barriers that identified by uh, our um, uh, stock taking while we were preparing for our uh, national adaptation uh, plan uh, was that uh, uh, the first barrier was uh, the availability and the accuracy of climate change risk assessment. Uh, uh, as uh, most of the participants know, reliable, consistent, and the complete meteorological and socioeconomic data is the foundation for climate risk assessment, monitoring, and risk reduction. Uh, however, though there have been some studies completed uh, in the country, uh, but mostly they are uh, sector specific. Uh, the quantity of climate risk data is not sufficient to adequately track uh, climate change impacts in Egypt. In addition, data um, uh, discrepancies uh, are common between government ministries and data that exist is not uh, reliable enough. Uh, furthermore, a clear assessment of the social and economic impact associated with climate change is necessary part of understanding vulnerability and uh, prioritize climate change interventions. Uh, therefore, uh, um, the Egyptian government um, uh, launched a project for downscaling uh, data and uh, visualizing impacts of climate change. Uh, uh, um, uh, and Hello. Therefore, the, uh, yeah, the, the Egyptian government, uh, uh, as I mentioned, decided to launch a project for downscaling data and visualizing the impacts of climate change. Uh, current adaptation strategies also will be included. However, the socioeconomic data is not available to be uh, integrated with the, um, uh, the, the climate change uh, interactive vulnerability map, but this will be tackled in the upcoming phase of the project in order to give uh, more um, uh, uh, in-depth information uh, for uh, planners when they uh, plan for any uh, um, uh, adaptation measures uh, uh, on different scales. The second barrier uh, identified by the stock taking was the institutional coordination and the capacity to undertake uh, advanced adaptation planning are limited. Uh, unfortunately, our policymakers uh, uh, are still uh, lacking broad-based understanding of climate change impacts and the technical skills uh, necessary to craft and implement uh, appropriate climate change adaptation, integration, and interventions. Uh, these gaps in capacity at the policy level can hinder not only the national adaptation process, but also future long-term climate change adaptation planning and the project implementation. In addition, uh, there is a limited cross-sector coordination on climate risk management. Therefore, Egypt government conducted a skills assessment in April 2019, led by the UNITAR, 
this uh, assessment uh, assessed more than 100 individuals through a combination of uh, survey and face-to-face -face interviews covering ministries of finance, planning, and environment. And also it will be expanded uh, for the rest of the cabinet uh, ministers uh, near future. Uh, the results uh, showed that while planning and finance officials uh, have a basic awareness of climate change, that this was derived from mainstream uh, media or the general education system, no professional training on climate change has been provided for them. Therefore, it is necessary for uh, uh, our colleagues in uh, those three ministries uh, to have foundational understanding of the topic and its implications for economy and society needs to be addressed if these ministries are to play an active role in integrating climate change into government system. And uh, this will be tackled uh, through designing special training courses. So uh, at the same time, uh, the ministerial staff were very supportive and uh, they open to uh, receive further training uh, as well as uh, other forms of practical support linked to job descriptions. Therefore, uh, uh, one of the policy uh, outcome driven approach to, tra to training design uh, is recommended to support uh, uh, the staff of uh, uh, ministries of uh, 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 finance and planning. Especially they consider are uh, two of the main uh, ministries that could help in mainstreaming climate change. The third barrier uh, um, uh, identified by the stock taking exercise is uh, uh, insufficient financial resources, uh, resources and budget allocations, uh, which have been dedicated to the adaptation planning. Uh, uh, addressing climate change vulnerability in Egypt uh, will require significant uh, investments, especially we have uh, very di uh, diversified economy as well as um, uh, uh, country uh, landscape. So uh, in order to align budgets and mobilize funds for climate change adaptation and mainstreaming of climate change adaptation into national planning uh, level sector uh, budgets and policies, uh, is needed. Uh, though this mainstreaming process has been started in Egypt uh, with the support of uh, some organizations such as uh, GIZ, uh, to date the efforts has been slow. This means that sector budgets do, uh, do not yet align funding needs to climate change priorities. Also funds that have been dedicated to climate change adaptation research in the past have not been managed in an effective way, especially in the agriculture and health sectors. Uh, overall, uh, public funds are uh, described as uh, not sufficient to meet climate change needs and the national adaptation plan process is hoped to be able to identify and catalyze other funding options, including private uh, sources. Uh, specifically, uh, the private sector is largely unaware of the risks posed by climate change in Egypt, and there is a room uh, for further uh, uh, sensitization of this group uh, through the national adaptation process. Uh, uh, finally, the stock taking uh, uh, exercise uh, identify also uh, uh, the lack of a holistic approach to adaptation planning as one of the barriers. Uh, so addressing uh, climate change vulnerability and adaptation efforts in Egypt to date has been focused on specific sectors, uh, particularly agriculture, water resources, and coastal zones. Uh, in the past, uh, some regions, particularly uh, North Coast and the Delta uh, in the Mediterranean region, have received more uh, media and funding attention than other regions around the country. And this is because of the threat of sea level rise and the fact that these areas have been hit by extreme weather events. Therefore, uh, these areas' uh, vulnerability is visible, and that's why they are receiving more attention, which means that uh, to date, most vulnerable assessments and adaptation studies have been conducted for these regions. However, uh, recorded this and the economic losses due to extreme weather events throughout the country have revealed the weaknesses of local authorities in handling climate change impacts 
and the need to address extreme weather events exacerbated by climate change in more comprehensive manner countrywide. Uh, there remains uh, a lack of government capacity, weak response efforts, and limited early warning uh, systems, infrastructure in many areas. Thus, it is uh, important to involve local authorities in the vulnerability assessment and the uh, identification of adaptation measures, as well as how finance uh, these um, municipalities, in addition to building the capacity of uh, uh, personnel of uh, local authorities uh, in the areas of the country that have thus uh, far been considered less vulnerable to climate change impacts. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the suggested the national adaptation plan uh, proposal will address in the future these uh, barriers and uh, with aim uh, to decrease uh, climate vulnerability for Egypt over time by improving uh, institutional and technical capacity for climate change planning, uh, furthering a comprehensive national climate risk assessment and the national adaptation plan framework uh, development and the integrating uh, climate change adaptation into national sectoral and regional uh, or local uh, planning and budgeting. Uh, uh, finally, uh, I'd like uh, again, to thank uh, Voita and uh, the project team for inviting me to shed uh, the light on this uh, uh, highly important topic for our countries. And I believe that uh, uh, the political changes around the, 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 the world uh, and um, uh, the situation in the United States uh, will help us uh, when they return <laughs> back to the <laughs> agreement uh, uh, to um, uh, foster uh, achieving the Paris Agreement objectives, which will help uh, all our developing countries and uh, develop, uh, uh, developed ones to face the challenge of climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Osman. I would now like to move on to uh, Dr. Lambi Afadure. He's the Director of Climate Resilience and Practice at WRI India. Chalani, could you share Dr. Afadurai's presentation, please? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Afadurai, sorry, you're on mute. Right. Thank you, Sanisha. At the outset, I would like to thank Slyken for having me here. I uh, know it's a huge topic, you know, climate change and disaster management are really huge topics. Of course, they are also interlinked. We, are, we know that, you know, off late there, are, there have been so many efforts made to bring synergies to these two, two, two topics together. Uh, climate related, related disasters are by far the most frequent natural disasters, as we know. And, you know, <clears throat> they're very intricately linked. You know, the changes that happen in climate has a bearing on the kind of disasters, the intensity of disasters what we face today. And day in and day out, you know, how many visibly you've seen uh, the disasters being projected everywhere across the globe. And one thing what we have to be really aware of is, you know, since the disasters have a visible kind of a uh, frame, people could easily relate to, whereas the climate change induced happenings, like particularly the onset events, Extreme events are so visible and people could easily relate to, whereas the climate-induced disasters like the droughts, uh, which is which is uh, been happening because of the slow onset events, it has not been understood to the level what how the other disasters have been understood. And secondly, it is also not so visible, so we don't get to kind of really relate to that well. You know, that's one thing which is important to realize and recognize. So uh, when you talk about the climate-related disasters, two things come to mind. The exposure and vulnerability are the largest contributors to overall risk. The one, as they say, only certainty about climate change is uncertainty. So no, we have to bat with that. There's, unless you can, can translate this uncertainty into risks, we can't really bring out any actions. So it's important to recognize that. And every of our, all of our efforts to be focused on converting these uncertainties to a some reliable to bring it to a reliable risk framework so that we know where the risks are, what is the intensity of risks, and how they're going to really manage those things. Move, please. Next slide, please. So, this is a simple diagram, very traditional one. The first part of my 
talk is somewhat, you know, whatever projecting is a kind of common knowledge, you know, it's nothing new, but it's provides a kind of context. That's the reason I'm just flashing these slides. You know, one of the things, you know, the climate is governed by both by natural variability as well as the human induced, you know, changes in climate. So uh, this pretty much governs the whole climate. And secondly, the disaster risks are pretty much dependent on the vulnerability, the kind of vulnerability, uh, the intensity of the disaster risk depends on the kind of vulnerability and the exposure, uh, what we see on the ground. And uh, off late development is very much, you know, uh, they say good adaptation is good development. So good disaster risk management is also a good development. So we should bear in mind that these are all linked and there is a kind of iterative process. So one should also recognize that so that it helps in planning. Next slide, please. So oftentimes we think, you know, climate extremes are only one of the factors that affect risk, but are, there are several layers of vulnerability, as you understand, you know, population explosion, exposure of people and assets, the, the intensity of the poverty, what you see, and the rapid urbanization which is taking place uh, today across the globe, and the environmental degradation are all, uh, these are key determinants of risk. So we cannot isolate and say, you know, risks are, that, that's the reason it's also difficult, it's becoming very difficult for us to plan and execute certain things with the actions at the ground level. And changing hazards and needs and characteristics of hazards have changed, you know, over a period of time. It depends on the kind of geography we are dealing with, if it is a coastal area, the risks and disasters are slightly different from what we see in a plain area, you know, so hill, in a hill, hilly area or something. So it's important to recognize that because all the planning should flow out of that, that kind of understanding and the knowledge what we have, depending on the kind of geographies we work with. So there is no doubt there is a enormous strain on the public resources today because of the frequency of the disaster. I don't, I'm not going into the numbers, you know, there are several studies available today in terms of the kind of intensity and what are the kind of you know impacts it creates the costs of those uh, in terms of the lives and livelihoods you know uh, it, it is you know imposing is enormous so it, there is a we can't add add a value to those things but still people have attempted to do that to kind of you know uh, give us sense of what it is all about next please so there are different kinds of disasters you know as you know uh, there are here we have categorized about four or five types of disasters, like the uh, hydromet disasters, ecological disasters, chemical disasters, geophysical disasters, and biological disaster, which we are experiencing today, uh, the past one year, and what we see in the form of COVID uh, is, a, is a kind of attributed to these, it could be considered as a biological disaster. Again, the first two important you know, categories, that is the hydromet disasters and ecological disasters have a, lots of relevance to climate variability and change, what you see. So it has a direct impact, and these are the two things which we have been, should be worried about. And also, it's oftentimes we also come across these two kind of disasters, which is more visible and which has a greater impact on our lives and livelihoods. Next, please. I'm, I don't want to go through the entire set of things, you know, but uh, it's okay, just to give a flavor of it. The impact of climate change in relation to disaster risks, as I told you, the synergies are beginning to kind of scratch the surface, try to understand. When you talk about the climate adaptation community and the disaster community, the disaster risk management community is far advanced because they've been working for a long time and they are now, we are coming to census, uh, our own census in terms of the adaptation very recently, maybe a couple of decades, we have invested more time and energy on that. So there is so much to learn from the disaster management community as such, you know, whatever they learn uh, is still applicable to the climate change adaptation context. So it's vice versa, this exchange of information is very critical. That's why the two communities have, co have to come together to work together. So. Uh, again, you know, we need to give to priority to disaster management structures. It's more of a governance problem as well. It is not just a kind of a, a, a ecological or environmental problem. It is also a, we see as a government problem. Government problem is a policy problem. Unless we have the right policies and institutional structures in place, uh, we cannot really, you know, to a large extent, we come a long way. I, mean, I don't want to be very pessimistic about it. You know, from we are moving from a era of era of uh, post disaster management, you know, in terms of the uh, you know, rehabilitation and uh, restoration to more of a preparedness today. You know, in India, where the country I come from, you know, we see today uh, the life lost is very limited compared to, you know, what 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, 15 years back, uh, the super cyclones and what we have witnessed and the kind of price we paid is far more than today. So uh, science is also improving, the forecasts are improving, so that helps us in a big way. So. Uh, 
So importance of disaster reduction in the integrated development planning and processes is very critical. Kind of integrate the adaptation measures into the development processes becomes very critical. Next one, please. So I, I just want to focus more on how part of it, because that knowledge is already there, what, when, how, uh, why, that part is there. But how part is very important for us. Now, we have seen across the globe, you know, particularly in Asia and Africa, several incremental steps in terms of adaptation has paid, and you know, climate adaptation has paid. We have very rich examples from this part of the world. But the problem is, you know, when you want to scale up, when you want to transform it to a different level, you know, particularly from the system's point of view, it, there are several challenges because, you know, adaptation is so local, as you know, and the disaster management also, is, you know, though there are so many common uh, I mean, knowledge could be derived of each of the disaster, the way we handle things. But then, you know, it is also, there is a unique geography, you know, so it's important to understand the nuances of that to plan well. So we are entering into transformative phase where we have good lessons learned from this incremental approaches so far. But what it ought to be, you know, in terms of transformative in the systems perspective, you know, because a dent in one place would affect in a different way the other place. So it's important to understand holistically that the holistic perspective is missing, and it is uh, for us to kind of really for us, for that to happen, we need to have a good understanding of the vulnerabilities. That is the first step in the process. To unless you have a good understanding of the vulnerability, both of the speakers before me, you know, prayer speakers have outlined the importance of this and what their country countries are doing. With respect to those vulnerabilities so that is a good starting point we gather that kind of information and build on it uh, to have a good robust system established next next slide please so go ahead to the full swing you know there are bits and pieces you know yeah the couple of more press press the enter button twice please yeah that's it so there are two important critical aspects of it one is the more specific information Today, information is very key. You know, we have come a long way in terms of the uh, providing climate information services. So information holds the fort really. You know, it is important to write information at the right time, helps to kind of you know, thwart any kind of disasters and help to a large extent in terms of you know, managing these disasters. Same thing with you know, uh, more of the time you have, better you could plan for the risks. But unfortunately, that is not the case. So you know, preparedness is very critical, de depending on the kind of information flow work we have. We have kind of mastered over this weather forecast for the short-term weather forecast, in large to a large extent, you know, across the globe, we see lots of improvements happening there. And you know, in terms of be it farmers advisory or a cyclone evacuation, we have really done a good job. But then, you know, uh, in terms of seasonal forecasts, particularly in a tropical setup like India and Southeast South Asian countries, it's very difficult, you know, because tropical weather is very difficult to understand. So there is an element of this thing. We're still science is really working on it, and you know, science is advancing. But then climate change. Which means, you know, decadal kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of forecast. Uh, to some extent, we could only provide some pointers. We cannot be concrete about uh, the kind of, uh, I mean, solution what we have for the climate change. You know, so this is the frame in, within, within which we should look at and organize our information in a way that we could really manage it, the disasters and the uh, climate variability in a better way. Next, please. A couple of more slides, you know. Yeah. So there are several complementary approaches. You know, what we learn from climate change adaptation also applies to disaster management things, you know. These are small steps, you know, to manage climate uh, disasters, bigger disasters. So we have to have the fundamentals, you know, organized in a way that, you know, people could relate and, you know, work with. Uh, that becomes fundamental. In simple words, building resilience is very, very critical at every level, you know, be the institutional resilience or the, you know, the community resilience contributes a lot for managing disasters very effectively. There are certain trade-offs, but we're not, so one has to be really cognizant of those trade-offs uh, to come out with good plans. Next, please. So you know, now we have multi-hazard early warning systems you know, for different uh, kind of disasters. We have different kinds of early warning systems which are working, uh, but you know, nevertheless, you can't say across the board, the capacities are there to provide that kind of you know, very nuanced information today. And uh, we start with the national risk profiles, as I indicated, that becomes very important. Unless you understand the risks and vulnerabilities, you cannot go ahead and provide a good policy or a good ground level action. <clears throat> so that, that becomes very good, that's the first starting point. And also where we see not much of advancement has taken place in the monitoring coordination with uh, disaster management plans today. And it's not only the disaster management plans, more in the in terms of the climate adaptation thing, you know, these MNDs is still an emerging area uh, because you know it is an iterative process, as I mentioned. Once you understand the risks, 
then you understand the vulnerabilities once the vulnerabilities are there then you have a plan of action then you have to have a continu continuously monitoring systems where the feedback loop becomes very important so that you can finally we are fine tuning the our own you know, priorities and the, the line of actions accordingly so mnd is an important component where the capacities are little low there and yeah capacity building i can't emphasize enough on the importance of that next please so one of the questions that comes to our mind is you know we always talk about the early warning systems how early is the early you know how good is the early uh, you know that that becomes a difficult task you know to a certain extent in a short term uh, forecast we could we are really good at it as i mentioned early uh, earlier uh, but then you know still a long way to go uh, that is where the science comes into play robust science helps you to understand the effects of it uh, not only the impacts but also the uh, both the cause and effect of it in a better way so we are also moving into the people centered uws there are so many successful stories across the globe today uh, but still uh, there's much to be wanted because it is not you not see uniformly people adapting to that you know that that's a huge question there you know some of them are very advanced in it some of them are not depending on the kind of you know because capacity building is a function of you know uh, finance technology the I mean, social capital a lot of other things are there so unless you get all those things organized it's very difficult to kind of act upon those early warning uh, information what you have so midst of the crisis decisions are not good decisions as we all know this is a very common sensical but it is important and we are moving away from those kind of an approaches today and uh, research as i mentioned research robust data innovation and learning are key to this process and there are of course there are some trade off between short term and long term long term impacts because today's adaptation becomes tomorrow it becomes maladaptation so that's how it's moving at a fast rapid speed so one has to really acknowledge that fact and move along with that next please a couple of more slides i'll just finish it next please yeah what do you mean by people centered early warning systems there are two four important components to it one is risk knowledge because particularly when we talk about adaptation disaster it is very you know a sense of history is very important now how people have managed in the past those kind of you know any extreme events or something so that knowledge has to be factored in we cannot design anything which is very unique because the cultural aspects are also embedded in those decisions so one has to recognize that and warning services have improved a lot as i mentioned earlier we have different technologies it comes to our aid uh, to provide the kind of information the right information to the right people today and dissemination to a large extent is also very very key outreach and dissemination we have really come a long way in those aspects you know technology really has helped us uh, from uh, announcing this about disasters through a loudspeaker today people use mobile phones and what not the apps that are very handy today to understand to provide that kind of a timely information and the response capability is also quicker but still a long way to go because we have to really uh, cover a large ground it's the institutional responsibilities are also critical either the institutions are in place the institution arrangements are really you know up to the mark uh, to um, to kind of uh, assimilate this information and provide that kind of a knowledge to the communities extension services particularly uh, play a very critical role in this process next please so this is a, again repetitive slide i'm sorry next please yeah this is the final slide i kind of feel the importance is uh, there are four elements to this whole thing evidence based research you know we have to build on that we need to really have gather good evidence what worked what didn't work often times there is a institution failure and i see a lot of you know institution memory particularly in a country like india after tsunami we have done a, a fantastic job i would say you know given the kind of you know, it's an unknown factor though it has, doesn't have any connection with climate change it's an unknown phenomena but people have raised to the question and you know the social capital came into play the institutions were geared up to handle that but unfortunately it also there is a set of bureaucracy which was handling that 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 has not been documented the kind of effort they have put in has not been systematically documented which is a weak link in the whole process i mean this is part of the bureaucracy where you see there are huge gaps there because the next work the next generation of people who come there don't have knowledge of how it has been handled in a particular institution becomes a memory becomes a critical point in training capacity building i cannot emphasize enough training and evaluation and the lastly people have been talked about talked about uh, the finance back part as well climate resilience and drr finance are very critical elements access to funding there should be certain ways of dealing with these things so uh, i will stop here you know uh, i've just kind of you know gave a larger picture and the flavor we are going into the details of it it takes a day to get really talk about this is a very interesting area we are all learning together in this process thank you very much for the opportunity
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Padre, for that presentation. I would now like to, uh, before we move on, uh, once again, I would like to kindly remind everyone to fill out the registration form that's on the chat. I will drop a link to it again, uh, once again, during the presentation. I would now like to invite uh, Ms. Anuja Seneri Ratna. She's, a, she's the director of the Disaster Management Center of Sri Lanka. Ms. Seneri Ratna. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Senakshi, as well as the Salikan Trust uh, for inviting us to uh, share some knowledge uh, on this uh, disaster risk reduction as well as the uh, climate change adaptation. So in this uh, short time period, I want to highlight reduction as well as the climate change adaptation. So basically, when we consider the climate change, uh, it is the frequency and the severity of hydrometeorological hazards when we uh, analyze our databases the the, uh, the, the clear uh, increased trend in this uh, extensive type as well as the intensive type disaster gradually this climate change also increased the vulnerability the hazard increases there but the vulnerability increasing of the risk so that uh, the gradually this climate change also increased the vulnerability as well as example with the sea level rise the people living in this coastal area their vulnerability is increasing so and the exposure as well so then risk is increasing dramatically in the climate change uh, another point what i want to highlight is that the new risk will generate so in the sendai framework for design that the generation of new risk uh, due to this climate change uh, with our understanding that new risk are, new risk this uh, new risk are not known to the people particularly because of these region these re uh, the dynamic pressures are increasing so then the the dynamic pressures with the uh, uh, hazards uh, happen in the environment, then there are some damages and losses. So then the, we call that uh, the risk tolerate that. So anyhow, with this dynamic pressure, it will create that capacity to adapt as well as the city and exposure to the weather related hazards. So all these three factors are increasing. So then uh, another to consider uh, is that the, uh, the the prices of the crops and the livestock market so we are experiencing uh, very extreme events with that our harvest will change and will i mean the prices of crops and livestock market and the environment and economic migrations and then the count are also uh, indirect factors need to be considered during this climate change and particularly uh, with the disaster risk reduction activities. So when we consider the disaster risk reduction and the climate change are not two things actually. These are very similar. And uh, so mainstreaming into the development is the sustainable way to achieve the climate change adaptation as well as the uh, disaster risk reduction. So uh, development is the common platform so that uh, to achieve these uh, two targets, that is disaster risk reduction as well as the climate change adaptation, uh, what we need to do is that we have to mainstream it into the de development in a sustainable way as these three things are mutually reinforced each other. So climate change adaptation mutually rein reinforced the risk reduction and all these two uh, tiers are reinforcing the development so without these two factors that climate change adaptation and the disaster risk reduction we can't have the uh, sustainable development so sustainable will, development will shake if we can't achieve these two things then another important factor what i want to highlight is that the strong connection in this climate change and the disaster risk reduction it could support to reduce 
the losses of climate related hazards uh, so that uh, we have to focus on the risk and vulnerability assessment so it is very important so we have to discuss the vulnerability assessment as well as the risk assessment now most of the time as per our experience uh, without considering the risk we are uh, using the hazard considering it itself as the risk but we have to understand based on this level of hazard uh, uh, and the level of the vulnerability or the scale of the vulnerability based on the characteristics of the element at risk uh, the risk of this particular hazard will be changed so when we are implementing the disaster risk reduction activities we have to address really the risk not the hazard level so if the risk is there, then we have to evaluate the risk and then we need to prioritize the risk reduction measures, what we need to uh, implement based on our capacities. So then the next one I want to highlight is the DRR, disaster risk reduction. It will benefit uh, long-term perspective uh, for the climate change adaptation. And it is uh, emphasized on the adapting and underlying uh, particularly the, I mean the, the, the during the vulnerability and uh, build the adaptive capacity so basically this uh, climate change adaptation so uh, climate change adaptation we have to consider the uh, level of vulnerabilities because it is the uh, human intervention factors of the risk so that in the climate change adaptation whatever the things we are doing so we have to uh, pay more focus on the vulnerability assessment and the level of the vulnerability. So it is also we have to consider when we are doing this climate change adaptation as well as the, uh, uh, the disaster risk reduction activities. So however, I mean, uh, nowadays, I mean, the, 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 what we can see is that there are, there are a lot of discussions going on the climate change adaptation as well as the disaster risk reduction. But beyond this discussion, we have to think that what is the, level of progress in the implementation and how these things have been socialized or institutionalized or uh, indi I mean how the, these things streamline into the individuals. Uh, finally, if we want to achieve good results, somehow or other, it's a challenging task, but somehow or other, what we need to do is that we need to incorporate all these climate change adaptation or a disaster risk reduction, whatever the activities into the society into the household level into the individual level so if not we can't achieve the resilience so so anyhow other when we are discussing the disaster risk reductions things so drr professionals uh, they are discussing the disaster risk reduction not only for the climate change or the climate related hazard or the hydrometeorological hazards so uh, drr professionals they always discuss the these things uh, based on the geological hazard so it is one uh, thing we have to consider when we are uh, implementing both type of uh, uh, actually the uh, climate change extreme events are the root causes for the disasters. Discussing always the uh, rapid uh, onset disasters or the extreme event, but in the climate change, set one such as this uh, uh, desertification then sea level rise and all these things having uh, long term or the so long term impact or these are we can consider as the slow onset disasters as well as we have also incorporated into these type of disasters when we are uh, doing uh, some or Clearly, as a developing nations, uh, nations in this uh, globe, because developed countries, they should not want people emitting a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and the things, but we have to consider that part also. So then, DRR, we, are, we always consider the current risk, but in the climate change, we have to consider the future risk as well consider the previous experience based on these things but in the climate change we have to consider the projections or the future risk 
are we can use the local knowledge but uh, compared to the climate change adaptation uh, it is very difficult to use because and in, in a way we can use but uh, not like in disaster risk reduction thing so uh, the other one i the related data so for a long period it is very difficult to get the uh, climate related data uh, so for the desi designers or the uh, policy makers or decision makers so all these uh, category this climate change scenarios or the climate change projections into their decision making process whether they are i mean as example so in uh the infrastructures for another 50 years so they need to have some climate change scenario based data to incorporate can uh, they can incorporate the safety factors for their structures that that would be sustain or stand by for years whatever for the life life uh, span of this infrastructure so these things are not available uh so so uh, really i can't say that not available but this lack of data and information in this climate or the professionals in climate change uh, i mean dealing with the climate change they are a bit reluctant to uh, maybe some due to some uncertainties of these future projections and all these things but what we have to do is that as scientists in a constructive way and then with these discussions all the scientists can come come to one conclusions and then with that we can we can share all these information particularly the forecasting or the projected information particularly related to the climate change it is based on the cost benefit analysis and all these things we can incorporate all these uh, factors into our so i want to highlight that one also then the other one is that uh, the, 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 there's another thing in the disaster uh, is that the how we have to calculate the increased risk due to this climate change for the this but still uh, some gray areas in how to calculate the uh, increase of the risk there are some uh, some some gray areas in these things and then uh, when this risk increase if we can assess this how this risk are increasing then it is very difficult to determine which level we have to prepare and which as well as the rehabilitation recovery and reconstruction activities so it is a real challenge for the disaster management of most of the countries who are facing who are more vulnerable to disasters or the extreme event of the climate change are in this uh, with that uh, they are facing that using the limited resources how they need to what is the level of the preparedness for the emergency response uh, limited resources so they need that the particular very uh, uh, informative data for all these things Ms. so Anita, we, Sorry, I just want to take uh, my sharing uh, things. So thank you very much uh, for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anuradhana, for that uh, very informative uh, address. I would now like to uh, request Dr. Nafisa Ismail. She's the Program Officer, Knowledge Management, Science and Institutional Affairs at APM to make a presentation. Chalani, would right. you be able to share her screen? All right, um, let me share. Screen. And for your information, I will uh, shut my uh, video for smooth connection. Okay. All right, let me try this video. All right, um, is the slide working good on your side? Yes, uh, we can, but we can also see your notes on the side. I'm wondering uh, if that's okay. So how is that possible? <laughs> uh, all right. You probably I should do this. All right, ready? Um, is it coming up right now? No? Not right, not not just yet. 
Not just yet. Um, let me hold on. Just to share it from our side. Uh, can you hold for a bit? Uh, how do I unshare again? So wait, let me just stop your screen share. That might. Yes, yes. Could you please do that? Okay. Right. Thank you. Would... And then let me try to share it again. I'm sorry yes. to take no your worries. time. All uh, right. Does it come up? It still come up with the notes, huh? Yes. All right. Wait. Um. Maybe display settings. Okay, display setting, and then probably just duplicate. Oh, uh, Miss uh, Dr. Isma, we could also share it from. Okay, right, that works. That this works. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let me start. Um, so first of all, um, thank you, Miss Anisha, uh, for the kind uh, for the kind introduction. Um, and then hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nafisa Ismail, representing. Um, APN, I'm a program officer at the Asia Pacific Network, in short, APN. So let me take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Ms. Wosita and everyone behind the scenes to uh, for organizing this Light and Trust workshop. And it's an honor to speak on behalf of APN. So I will talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about APN and then share a working paper that me and my colleague are currently working on. All right. Um, so, uh, our, I mean, APM focus areas are broad and um, it's under uh, overarching arching umbrella of global change and sustainability and range from climate change, climate variability, biodiversity and ecosystem services to risk reduction and re resilience and also societal aspects of or human dimension uh, of global change. We have uh, four strategic goals that supports uh, regional research collaboration, build capacity to participate in scientific research, encourage uh, science policy interactions, and cooperate with other global like-minded organizations. So based from our four strategic PACE report, there are over 650 outputs from 119 projects, which revolves around high priority topics recommended from our member countries. Um, if you could see the phase uh, cloud on the bottom left of the screen, some of the key priority topics uh, of our member countries have included climate change and its impacts such as extreme weather events, climate downscaling, disaster risk reduction, and technology transfer. And um, our report is also available on the website uh, if you are interested. Um, and next is um, APN also has been engaged in a special issue published by the Elsevier Environmental Research, which produced 15 articles, and um, one of it is the APN Knowledge Synthesis. So this activity has brought all APN project leaders together in an international symposium and write shop, um, adding real value to the need uh, for face-to-face -face and also peer-to-peer -peer collaboration at the regional level, particularly in writing and um, peer-reviewing manuscripts. So, um, as you have already had a, an idea of the background of APN, let's now move into the working paper that me and my colleague are working on. So, um, as I uh, like been emphasized before, common knowledge of in disaster uh, risk management field is um, how spe the IP special report of the IPCC emphasized on the need to understand the vulnerability and exposure by you know, determining the, how weather and climate contributes to disaster, the design and adaptation implementation, as well as the disaster risk management issues. Here, I would like to emphasize that the, the, as being you know, frequently emphasized that DRR and C, CCA, which is uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation share similar values in which increasing uh, society's resilience while reducing their vulnerability. And um, additionally, the Hyogo framework of action and also the Sendai framework emphasize on the importance of having information on um, hazards, vulnerabilities, impact, and actions which has been taken by the uh, society, um, emphasizing on the people-centered approach. So in 2015, we noticed that most of the APN projects that we receive um, touches upon the effective pathway and uh, transformation to sustainability as well as increasing resilience and the disaster risk reduction, which then um, initiated the adoption of risk reduction and resilience as one of um, APN thematic area. All right, um, going further. 
So now that we have some background of uh, information, background on the paper, um, I'll go to uh, quickly uh, a brief summary of the paper. So the paper is based around the uh, five-year progress review of the Sendai framework by uh, Professor Rajib Shaw and Dr. Rianti as the editors. And for your information, the paper is still being written at this time of presentation. So the idea of the paper is to assess um, APNs, uh, climate change adaptation, and also disaster risk reduction related project outcomes between um, the, the framework of the Sendai, which is 2015 to 2020, and the impacts in the integration and also mainstreaming uh, how DRI is being mainstreamed into governance. Um, we want to present the readers with uh, relevant projects in the Asia Pacific, which contributes to the progress of the S uh, to the Sendai framework implementations by um, examining the project's key outcome by exploring these three points, uh, which is the main issues in implementing the RR in government in governance, the types of RR measures um, produced and also introduced through the projects, uh, also the status of knowledge and information uptake among the target beneficiaries and stakeholders. Uh, Moving on, um, I'll share with you the results of uh, our findings. Um, we gathered 20 project leaders to answer a 16-question online survey, and all respondents are based in the Asia-Pacific region. So uh, as you can see, most 47% uh, of them are from the academia, and 33% of them are from international and regional organizations. And most of them are um, working on with, with the national level of uh, government. And then um, next is moving on to the types of measures taken. We found that 70% um, of the projects implemented uh, the non-structural me measures, which is using information, training, and education practices um, followed by the combination of both, uh, both structural and non-structural me measures. So on the uh, next uh, pie chart from the disaster dis management cycle, uh, it's found that, that most of the APN projects are focused on the pre-disaster state area. All right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, most of the, the disaster risk management strategies or innovations taken up by the project leaders are through assessments and index approach. And the next one is the community disaster risk uh, reduction um, strategies. And moving on, um, we also ask um, project leaders of which effort, um, which effort did their project contributed throughout the disaster phase, and um, most of them uh, responded uh, on the pre-disaster mm -hmm. stage. And then um, we also ask like what, uh, which sector was the most impacted in the last five years, and as you can um, visibly see, it's the food and agriculture which is um, affecting the livelihood of the people. Um, moving on to the next result. Uh, so this graph indicates uh, the project that con uh, the project's contribution to the Sendai framework targets. As you can see here, the highest is target two, um, having um, project leaders mentioned that uh, part of their project has related relatedness to the life-saving agenda in building resilience to disaster. All right. Um, next is um, when we ask uh, project leaders about the level of contribution of their project outputs to uh, the Sendai framework on cre creation of a disaster plan, um, they mentioned somewhat uh, contributed. So these projects were running and completed during the first five years of the Sendai framework, which is 2015 to 2020. Okay. And also we asked them about the status uptake. Um, most of the project leaders claim that um, the results, I mean, the um, uptake is about 40, 49, 40, 41%. Uh, moving on to, the next slide, um, we, ask, we also asked project leaders about what is the element for a successful DRR incorporation at the local level. And as you can see, the biggest word here is local. This shows us that in order to pave way to build back better 
and uh, to increase the resilience, stakeholders at the local level should be involved and empowered uh, to take action in disaster risk uh, management plan. So we also ask um, what are the key factors of uh, integrating DRR within and across sectors. Um, then it's no surprise that communities pop up as the main component in the uh, integration. All right, so uh, last but not least, um, we, from the paper, we understand that, you know, um, acknowledging, acknowledging multi-race environment where decision-making uh, related to DRR is particularly complex and therefore it should be a combination of strategies. And in making um, pre-disaster response effective, uh, measures should consider both um, structural and also non-structural. Mm -hmm. Um, we also not, uh, understand that um, diversification of livelihood is also a kind of no regrets strategy that should be introduced to the local um, communities. Um, what we find um, challenging is in the implementation of DR, like being emphasized before by our distinguished speakers previously, is the lack of integration or also mainstreaming of DR into development um, planning. And so DR. And therefore, DR strategies can um, you know, be strengthened and mainstream across sectors by linking it um, to climate change adaptation. So the issues of DR governance involve levels of coordination and also coherence and should involve um, private sectors partnership. Um, lastly, um, what we found very interesting is that the results justify the needs um, to integrate uh, climate change adaptation and um, disaster risk management in achieving a sustainable development. Um, with that, I finished my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail. Uh, we will now move on to Ms. Linda Siegel's presentation. She is a PhD candidate at the University College of London Faculty of Law. Um, while uh, Ms. Eagle's presentation, uh, Palani, please do share uh, your screen. Also, I would like to kindly remind all our participants to, if you have any questions for the uh, panelists, please do drop them on the chat. And also kindly do complete the registration form. Which the link is available on the chat. I will drop it once again. Um, right, the screen is shared. Ms. Siegel, are you ready? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. I, I, I'll try sharing my video, but I may turn it off as well um, if, if the connection uh, goes, goes bad. <laughs> okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, this is the, the, the title of, of my presentation today. I, I, I've been asked to uh, look at climate and disaster risk management through the lens of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, which is an established me mechanism under the UNFCCC, um, the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. So I'll really be focusing on the climate aspect of, of risk management um, and hope that this helps to provide a little bit of, of framing for those of, uh, of you who um, provided very rich uh, presentations on, um, uh, on what's going on regionally and locally. And first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Vosisa, Vosisa and Slycan Sly Trust and, and the team for inviting me to provide this presentation. And, and I do hope that this framing um, will help us all um, work more closely together as, as a stakeholder group going forward. So what I wanted to do, and I'm a lawyer, so forgive um, you know, me, me sort of quoting a chapter and verse uh, on legal documents, but uh, these decisions um, under the UNFCCC are important and, and, and are significant to the framing of how risk management is handled. Um, in the, the climate change process. So even before the establishment of the Warsaw International Mechanism, a year before parties uh, discussed what the role of the convention was in promoting uh, approaches to address loss and damage. And one of the central roles of the convention is enhancing knowledge and understanding. And this is a, an acronym, CRM, Comprehensive Risk Management. Comprehensive Risk Management is the terminology used um, in the loss and damage arena to, to look at how um, the elements of, of risk management uh, work together. So one of the central uh, aims of, of the of the convention is to enhance knowledge and understanding of comprehensive risk, risk management as it refers to uh, 
loss and damage in that context. Again, in, in this decision, um, parties were invited to implement comprehensive risk management approaches to address loss and damage. So this notion of CRM um, within the loss and damage uh, context is fundamental to addressing losses and damages from climate change impacts. And further, the decision identifies areas requiring further work um, around uh, risk reduction, risk sharing, and risk transfer tools. So there's a recognition that we still need to know more. Certainly that was eight, nine years ago, but I, I don't believe that um, we, we still know all we should know or could know around these issues. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, just, to, just to provide um, some more legal framing for how uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism deals with uh, climate risk, um, the Warsaw International Mechanism and, and its executive committee were established um, in 2013. And uh, paragraph five of that decision sets out the functions of the WIM. And one of the central functions of the WIM is to include the addressing of gaps in the implementation of comprehensive risk management approaches and enhancing action and support to, to enable countries to implement CRM approaches to address loss and damage. So again, um, risk management being central to addressing losses and damages from climate change. A year later, the executive committee which has the role of implementing the functions of the Warsaw International Mechanism was um, composed, it has an equal split between developed and developing country rep representatives. And one of the uh, decisions that year in 2014 was to allow the XCOM to set up subgroups to help execute its work. And, and one of the subgroups, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, that subgroup, is a subgroup or an expert group on comprehensive risk management. Um, so I'll, moving on to 2015, a year later, we got to the Paris Agreement, which has an article on loss and damage, Article 8. And this article um, allows the, the Warsaw International Mechanism and its work to be enhanced and strengthened and includes a number of areas of cooperation and facilitation that speaks directly to uh, risk management, including early warning systems. And we heard about uh, uh, that in previous presentations, emergency preparedness. Um, again, we heard a lot about how preparedness is a, is a critical element to um, disaster risk management or risk reduction, um, comprehensive risk management itself, and looking at risk insurance facilities. So the, the current uh, climate change framework envisions uh, risk management and risk management activities, many of which we heard about um, at going on at the national and regional level with uh, pr prior presentations um, in included in the framing at the international level. And, and finally, the uh, decision that adopted the Paris Agreement um, asked the XCOM to establish a clearinghouse um, for risk transfer, which has been done. Thank you. So let's look at a little bit at the work of the XCOM and how it includes a comprehensive risk management over the years. The XCOM, which is, implements the WIM, uh, has been working since 2015. It has had an initial two-year work program, which promoted comprehensive risk management approaches, including a drafting of a compendium on comprehensive risk management and, en and encouraged the take up of comprehensive risk management approaches through access to finance. And when we heard um, uh, very much in, in previous presentations, how financing is critical to the upt uptake of uh, risk management. Um, in the current five-year rolling work plan, the XCOM has a strategic strategic work stream that is dedicated to comprehensive risk, risk management. And we'll talk about what the scope of that is. Um, uh, but comprehensive risk management is envisioned to be uh, risk assessment, um, risk retention, risk transfer, and, uh, and, and recon reconstruction or rehabilitation um, after a disaster. Um, and 
the uh, this this strategic work stream um, includes the establishment of a technical expert group on comprehensive risk management, and I um, am pleased to say that I am a member of of that technical expert group. Next slide, please. So let's look at a little, drill down a little bit deeper into what this technical expert group on comprehensive risk management has done so far. It was established in 2019 to assist the XCOM um, with the following uh, tasks, identifying gaps in methodologies, um, identifying priority areas for increasing capacity and investment, we, talk, we heard a lot about the need for uh, additional capacity and, and certainly um, additional finance, financial investment and targeted investment, providing information on tools and in instruments addressing the limits of current uh, comprehensive risk management approaches and identifying how the clearinghouse for risk transfer can be used to support the work of the XCOM. In addition, um, the uh, Technical Expert Group on Comprehensive Risk Management, the TEG CRM, um, is tasked with facilitating stakeholder engagement and building capacity. Again, issues we heard a lot about this morning, or this afternoon, depending on where you are and facilitating the development and dissemination of guidance. And, and I think this is a, a key um, aspect of capacity building certainly, and, um, and, and something that I think that, that I will take back to the TEG CRM um, based on uh, today's presentations that um, we potentially need to get better at communicating with local stakeholders and, and communities, um, which certainly came out um, in, in the APN uh, presentation uh, just now. Um, so the, the first meeting of the TEG CRM was on August uh, 29, in August 2019, and the, and, uh, the group uh, drafted a plan of action, and this plan of action was agreed by the XCOM a few months later in October of 2019. In the same month, there was a workshop um, held on strengthening capacities for climate risk assessment, um, which included um, issues around data gathering, which is another issue we, that, um, that I, we've heard much about today. Um, and, and the outcomes of that workshop are available on the UNFCCC Secretariat website. So I encourage you to, to have, a, have a look at that. Um, the TEG CRM given current situation um, globe, with the global pandemic, what unfortunately was forced to meet virtually in 2020, um, reviewed the work so far done under the plan of action and, and reported to the XCOM and the XCOM reviewed this, the, the, the work uh, done so far um, in September at its latest meeting. Um, the way forward for the TEG CRM is to continue implementation of the plan of action. The plan of action has uh, deadlines for work to be completed um, this year. Um, so, so most of the plan of action should be completed um, by the end of this year. Uh, and the, the plan of action will be updated and added to um, where re relevant and required and, and, and where the XCOM um, has asked uh, for that to happen. Next slide, please. Just to just to point out, and we heard this about cross ministerial um, integration and and cross cutting work uh, uh, amongst ministries. The, the <sighs> CRM is a cross cutting issue, and there are a number of other expert groups under the XCOM which are relevant um, and where the TEG CRM's work is relevant, and these are include the task force for displacement, which really looks at human mobility issues, um, the expert group on non-economic losses. And we heard uh, today lots about um, the cultural aspect of, of dealing with disasters and, and comprehensive risk management approaches. Um, we heard a, a lot also about slow onset events. There's an, a, an expert group on slow onset events um, under the XCOM and a, a, a newly established uh, expert group on action and support, which looks at not only finance, but technology transfer and capacity building. And again, uh, key elements for risk management that we've heard about um, or already this morning. And the XCOM has uh, a mandate now to develop a set of technical guides around each of these work streams, including comprehensive risk management and 
one of the contents of these technical guides is, is a section on risk assessment. Um, so keep an eye out for those technical guides. Um, they should be uh, rolling out um, this year and, and going forward. And hopefully these will provide useful information for, um, for, the, for uh, practitioners at the national and, and subnational level. Other bodies under the convention initiatives and mechanisms uh, where the TAG CRM and where uh, comprehensive risk management is relevant is the Standing Committee on Finance, which liaises directly with the Green, Green Climate Fund and other of uh, climate finance mechanisms under the convention, um, the Technology Executive Committee, the the XCOM and the and the Tech worked on a joint um, a joint policy brief that looked at, actually looked at at. Uh, Coast risks of uh, of coastal communities to to climate change, um, and and just to to give you a a, a quick uh, overview of some of the institutions and organization out organizations outside the convention that uh, the TEG CRM works with um, a number of UN agencies, and and each of these agencies are members of the TEG CRM, um, UNDRR, which um, I, most of you probably know um, kind of manages the implementation of the Sendai framework, the um, World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization, which really does an awful lot these days with climate data, um, the World Food Program. These are just a, 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 a cursory list. There are more, the International Fed, Fed, uh, Federation for the Red Cross, um, INSHU Resilience, which is a, a German-led initiative um, that looks at, at uh, marshalling disaster and climate finance um, and, and delivery on that, and also has a, a facility for answering questions on, on risk management issues, and certainly academia and NGOs, um, um, me being one of, of that group. Um, next, please. So I, I, I'm going to wrap up now because I know we're well, well over time, but I wanted to just provide a few conclusions, uh, conclusion, conclusory mar remarks and, and, and possible recommendations. And certainly um, these, will, these, are, these recommendations and my IDs have, I have been enriched by what I've heard um, so far today. So from the outset, there has been a recognition that comprehensive risk management approaches are central to addressing loss and damage um, from climate change impacts. And, and we can see that even before the Warsaw International Mechanism was established, this notion that comprehensive risk management is central and that parties should be engaging um, in comprehensive risk, risk management approaches, um, it was there. Um, the scope of work of CRM, and, and I, I think it was really important um, uh, that one of our presenters brought out the, the notion that key risks vary across regions and so that these approaches will vary across regions and certainly also across timelines. Um, but data gathering is still central and, and I'm hearing that the lack of data is still a critical issue. Um, and, and without that data doing uh, viable risk assessments is, is also difficult, but that risk reduction, risk transfer and risk retention are also elements of, of how the, the international uh, community, the climate change community um, <clears throat> envisions the scope of work of, of comprehensive risk management. And there are responsibilities all across um, at each level. Um, the international community, as I have expressed, at least under the UNFCCC, has a, a responsibility to look at comprehensive risk management approaches and to promote the impl implementation of them. Regional organiza organizations are certainly critical, and especially in, in, in terms of, of um, pooling uh, capacities uh, of developing country uh, countries in the region and, and also gathering and understanding um, the different types of risks and certainly individual countries and, and the Sendai framework is, is specifically um, focused on, on uh, country level activity. Um, the way forward, um, this is a, 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 a pretty uh, a small list, but the, the TEG CRM will continue to work, including in its uh, cross-cutting 
uh, capacity, and we looked at, at, at where the work of the TEG CRM uh, cuts across um, uh, organizations and, and bodies inside and outside the convention process. And I, I think we're in a unique uh, point in time globally with this pandemic, um, it, and that addressing climate change, disaster risk management, and, and recovering from the pandemic are, are, are efforts that I think we should, we must um, uh, embrace all at the same time. And, and, um, and, and as one of the past speakers said, the, the development or the, the platform for doing this, for addressing these three bits all together is the development platform and, and the sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda. And I know that the UN is really looking um, very closely at how these issues are intertwined. And, and so I um, believe that uh, the TEG CRM as it contributes to an understanding of climate change risk management needs, needs to feed into the, those processes going forward. And I certainly think that I will take back to the TEG CRM um, the, the notions that I've heard today around um, the need for local engagement, community engagement, um, capacity building, and, and, and better communication. Um, so thank you all for your uh, rich contributions to today's discussion. And, and I do hope that this provides you a little bit of a framing for how the climate change um, community is looking at risk management and, and management of climate risks. Thank you again to Slycan Trust um, for inviting me to speak. And, and uh, I look forward to um, um, further engagement today. Thank you very much, Ms. Segal. Uh, we now move on to our final presentation by Mr. Sunny Ayuba. He's the founder and executive director at Young Volunteers for the Environment in Niger. Um, also, I would like to kindly request people once again uh, to complete the registration form if you already haven't. And if you have questions for the speakers, please do drop it on the chat. We do have a short time for Q&A that we'll have get it as well. Uh, Sunny, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I want to just share a kind of experience based on uh, some project that we implement here in Niger in Sahel area. So my presentation, can you please uh, uh, share the presentation? Yes, uh, Chalani. So I want to talk about climate change in Niger and institutionalizing sustainable CBDRM. CBDRM means a community-based disaster risk management. So as maybe some are aware about uh, the Sahel area, in, in, in Sahel we are facing uh, uh, some climate crisis. Like uh, here in Niger, uh, the global warming are involved in Niger. Indeed, uh, climate change has an impact on the following main climate risks. We are facing um, floods, drought, Storms and dust because the Sahel is uh, it, this is part of the Sahel characteristic, and also the next slide, please. We the next slide, please. The extreme temperature, you know, it's very hot uh, at the time in Asia, especially like uh, more than six months in the in the year, and those past. 10 or more than the past 10 years, we are facing this uh, high temperature. We, we have the strong wind, the bushfire, and locust attacks also. So when we talk about the consequences, you can see directly uh, the map of Niger. You, you know, the first map talk about the drought situation in Niger. Recently, you will see uh, the right color is mean that uh, it's very high uh, drought to the area where drought is very high. And uh, the second uh, map talk about flood in Asia. So you can see that the, the country is like, even in the north of the country that uh, is near of the desert, we are facing uh, several flood every year now, the past three years. Uh, uh, the most uh, important is this year, we are facing uh, uh, a kind of flood that uh, we, it never happened in the country since the, the past 50 years. So 
that allows us to talk about the community-based disaster risk management. The next slide, please. So why, uh, when we talk about uh, the community disaster risk management, uh, why do we need it? Because the impact of this disaster are most immediately uh, and intensively. I think we might have uh, lost Sunny temporarily. Um, maybe until he gets back, I would like to request if anyone has questions to drop it on the chat and maybe we could uh, go in for a quick uh, Mentimeter break. So, until Sunny comes back. Right, Sunny. Uh, so, for those who are unfamiliar with the platform, please log on to menti.com and use the code 59497350. I'll just um, have it on now. Hi, Sunny. I have a connection issue, so sorry yes. for that. No worries. Uh, Sunny, if you could just give us one minute. We just opened up a Mentimeter to maybe break some ice. So, uh, okay. yeah. So, we'll just maybe share that. So, if you could see my screen, just to get an understanding where you're joining us from. So, we have participants from UK, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, India, Japan. Let me just keep it up for about 10 seconds more. Greenland and Tobago. Bangladesh, UK, right. And I'm um, just going to move on to the next question, uh, which is uh, how would you best describe your organizational affiliation? So whether you're a CSO, government organization, private organization, academia, or other. So for those wondering what's happening, please log on to menti.com and use the code 5949735. So we have lots of people from other. So maybe uh, if you all could, whoever who selected other, please uh, state the organization on the chat so that it's uh, good to also know who's joining us. All right. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for taking part in our little um, uh, icebreaker. Uh, so Chalani, you could maybe start sharing your screen again. I'll just stop sharing mine. And uh, Sunny, uh, you could maybe uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm talking about the, the need. What, why do we need uh, the CBDRM? Because, uh, okay, you can go to the, to the fifth one. Yes. So the impact of disaster are most immediately and intensively felt at the local level. This is the first reason. Also, many of the most effective tools to reduce exposure to hazards, such as land use, regulation, and personal building code are at the local level also. The local level is where the basic environmental management and regulatory governance functions that are essential for effective disaster risk management are concentrated. It's also at the local level where the government and the communities can best engage with each other and work together. So local DRR goes hand in hand with the promotion of sustainable local development and the local environment and management. Local actors are the first responder when disaster occur. And uh, also, uh, 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 feed, hence feedback and adjustment can be adopted and implemented more quickly and according to the specific context. So, uh, this is part of the element that uh, why people we need uh, to have something at the community level. So the next slide, uh, when we want to have like this CBDM, we have like the essential element. Uh, among the essential element, we have like seven. Those seven elements. Uh, the first one is the participatory process because we have when we want to engage the community, we have like to make the, part, the process participatory. We have to make this. Uh, process also responsive. We have to make it integrated to integrate all the community. We have to make it proactive because we know that the community have their own law, knowledge that help them to understand the upcoming disasters. We have to make it comprehensive. So uh, by comprehensive, we know the structural and non-structural preparedness and mitigation measures are undertaken, short, medium, you know, term and long term measure to address vulnerabilities. We have also uh, to take it like a number six, uh, the multi sectoral and multidisciplinary 
sectors. This allows us to consider our roles and the participation of all the stakeholders in the community. We, we know that in the community, we have several people with several backgrounds, several knowledge. So we have to uh, make them together to work on this. So the last element is the empowering. Empowering people option and capacities and are increased. More access to and control of resources and basic social services. This is why we what we mean by empowering. So when we go for the, uh, the, uh, the next slide also, the CBDM process. So the community-based disaster risk management process is along like seven, uh, the next slide, please. Okay. So this process, uh, the first element of the process is the selecting the community. First thing we have to select the community. We have to uh, make the report building and understanding. The third one, participatory disaster risk assessment. We have to make assessment to know at the community level, the kind of uh, disaster that they are facing. It, it means disaster and also it means climate impact uh, that this community are uh, facing. We have to make the community-based disaster risk management planning because we can't do an activity without the planning. And then we have to make a community managed implementation because it's very important to let uh, the community have a role in the process that allow them to more uh, uh, honor the process. And the last one is the monitoring and evaluation. It's also important after this process or during the process to have a monitoring and evaluation plan that allow you to more uh, adjust or to more take in consideration the new coming disaster or the new coming situation. The next slide is why we, what we call a sustainability because it's in TV then the, the process is to have like a kind of institutionalizing sustainability disaster risk management. By definition, uh, sustainability is mean the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level or over a period of time. So for this one, we have like a key element for, for success, uh, success the, the, key, the success factor for institutionalizing is sustainability BDM. For sustainability, we have like uh, this, uh, the element like uh, the permanence, the inclusion, the adaptiveness, the ownership. I already talked about the ownership and the effectiveness. It's very important to have this key element for sustainability. Uh, adapt, uh, uh, the inclusion. So uh, it's important also when we go to the, uh, the next slide that talk about the, the key factor for institutionalization. For the institutionalization is meant for the action of establishment, something as a norm in an organization of culture. So it means that we know that the community have their own knowledge they have uh, the local knowledge that we can take in to build something better and stronger for them. So for this, we have some element like a, a, a structural mechanism is to have to know the importance of having the government recognized committee and structure in place down to the local level responsive of TBD activities. It's good to have at the community level a setting committee that can be recognized by the local authorities to make activities or to lead the activities. Uh, when we go to funding, it's important the need of, for financial support to be stable and adequate at the organization and government level for civil initiative. We can make uh, those initiatives without funding. So it's very important uh, to have or to make the government, the local government accountable or to make them put money or resources that can allow to have some civil activities. Uh, when you go to the accountability, it's very important the need to promote monitoring and evaluation of CBDM initiative by various actors, including communities members. Because when we try to make some activities, it's very important to let community also be part and other stakeholders. So that's allow all of us, uh, all uh, uh, the stakeholders to be accountable uh, be, uh, behind this, uh, this process. The other element, please. Yeah, the policy and the environment is very important. Uh, uh, please come back. The policy and, and, uh, and environment is very important to have some policy because we know at the country, they have a lot of uh, policies uh, uh, for climate change, for disaster risk management, the Sender Framework, the Paris Agreement, uh, the UN Convention and Climate Change. All those allow countries to develop some policies and also 
a part of some strategic document uh, like the, the 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 national plan for adaptation or that document uh, the house uh, uh, several policies so the need for civilian to be included in the government policy and plan at both national and local level is very important uh, to have uh, to make an advocacy for this and uh, the capacity is very important also to find the capacity of the stakeholder the importance of including element of technical support to strengthen civilian capacity of different actors this this is very important so to take in consideration so this is uh, these are the key elements uh, to institutionalize a sustainable CD, cbdm process uh, to fight against climate change and reduce the disaster risk management at community level it's very important this uh, are the key elements that uh, I want to share today based on our uh, three years experience program that called CBDM is a kind of program making that we make together with the GNDR, the Global Network for Civil, uh, Civil Society Organization and Disaster Risk Management uh, in Africa and, uh, and uh, in other countries. So this is part of uh, the key element, uh, the finding during the process of uh, the implementation of this project. Uh, the last slide. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I will be in touch if uh, there are questions about the community-based disaster risk management in the context of climate change issues. Thank you again. Thank you, Sunny, and uh, thank you, Shalini, for sharing that. Uh, just let everyone know we don't have uh, Dr. Ranji Kunyavar with us today um, due to a sudden uh, call. Uh, so if anyone has any questions for the speakers, kindly do drop them in the chat. We will be happy to take them forward. Uh, furthermore, please do fill out your registration form. I've linked it on the chat as well. Uh, it's a Google form. It will take more than two minutes to fill. Thank you very much. Uh, so moving on to the questions, I would now like to maybe request all our panelists, if possible, who was on the call to turn on your videos. So we'll have all of you all in one space. Uh, we did have some questions from earlier that I made note of earlier in the chat. So we had a question from uh, Dr. Nan uh, oh. Nambi. Are you we, on? we have uh, some uh, question. Uh, mm -hmm. I am speaking from uh, Bangladesh, uh, Mr. Hangurong Taludar. So, uh, Sensia Madam, we have a uh, question uh, to you uh, that uh, we like to uh, say that uh, Bangladesh uh, Climate and uh, Action Group, uh, there is so gap in uh, their coordination to work together uh, for the disaster risk reduction management of both uh, climate change. And uh, we are work uh, together, uh, coordination uh, gap uh, to um, uh, mitigation uh, in uh, climate change, uh, disaster risk management. Uh, please uh, discuss about it. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, so, the question is on addressing gaps and in coordination between the groups. Um, I'm wondering if uh, maybe Mr. Osman, would you like to take that question? Uh, I believe that um, uh, our uh, uh, developing uh, countries, uh, they are coordinating together uh, during the negotiation, uh, uh, different among the groups under the G77, uh, in order to have uh, uh, a coherent position uh, to guarantee that uh, better coordination between uh, our countries in order to guarantee that uh, the funding for climate change adaptation, for example, will be available and uh, it will be uh, sufficient for uh, our uh, needs. Uh, however, still uh, uh, some efforts still needed in order to have better coordination and to have a stronger position uh, in front of uh, other uh, developed countries uh, to guarantee that we can uh, uh, have better allocation for funding, uh, achieve uh, Paris Agreement uh, goals, uh, and achieve sustainability. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much. I am. I want to know if Ms. Uh, Senavitakna from the Disaster Management Center of Sri Lanka, Ms. Andras, are you still on the call? Uh, looks like she's left. Right. So um, maybe we could also look into a multi-actor coordination between climate and disaster fields. Uh, once again, I would like to kindly request all of the speakers to turn on their uh, mic uh, videos if possible. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nambi, I'm wondering, would you like to uh, take on the question on um, uh, on what Mr. Rahman had and maybe tie that up with with uh, you know coordination between climate and disaster fields? Right. Uh, sorry, Dr. Nambi, you are muted once again. I didn't get the question. Could you please repeat? That? Sorry. So the question that Mr. Rahman had earlier was on the the gap uh, in coordination between groups, and maybe we could perhaps add to that and uh, look at multi-actor coordination between climate and disaster fields. So if you could add to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are certain structures. You know, you can't say that there is not existing. I mean, it depends on the kind of you know country you're dealing with and the institutions. Uh, because there are now the national disaster management authorities are established in most of the countries. It might have different forms, but then they, of course, it's true that they are not very connected with the, because climate change is a kind of a sectoral issue, as you know, no, many sectoral, there are silos in terms of handling climate change. There is, a, of course, there are in few countries, some coordinating, general coordinating bodies have been created, but it is not very effective because still, you know, that's where the mainstreaming problem also comes through. I mean, to a simple extent, you know, there should be some dialogues, you know, happening between these two, uh, I mean, between the departments as well as the uh, central structure for disaster management. I see some changes happening, at least in the Indian case, but I don't know how it's functioning. Because there is a very concerted effort to be made to create a structure, uh, some representations uh, from each of these things to centrally coordinated bodies to be created. There is a gap. It's easier said than done uh, because the nature of their work is uh, not, you know, the overlaps in many ways at the same time, uh, it's siloed in many ways, you know, that, that's a typical problem we face in mainstreaming. Uh, I don't have a perfect answer for that. There are certain models available and could look at it. And that's how, that's how I put it, you know, to see the best practices, which is whatever is available, we could imbibe and, you know, take it further. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pallari. Um, Ms. Siegel, I'm wondering if you would like to add to the question as well. <laughs> Ms. Siegel, sorry, you are unmuted. Yes. Sorry, I, I, that happens a lot. Um, yeah, I, I'd just like to provide a, an, an example or a model um, of, of uh, a region that has worked very hard to, to try and coordinate uh, disaster risk management and climate change adaptation. And again, using um, sustainable development as the platform, and that's the Pacific region. Um, in 2017, they uh, drafted and agreed um, the framework for re resilient development in the Pacific. And this framework is specifically um, targeted at combining disaster risk management and climate change adaptation um, action with a set of principles and, and, um, and, and key steps to be taken. Um, so that that is, a, I think, a very clear example of a framework that is um, still in its early stages, um, but is already be, beginning to be implemented. And the the, the kind of targets um, for both these two areas um, is is um, meeting the sustainable development goals. So it really does um, pull together each of those three elements. Um, and 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 there are some regional committees that that work on on uh, coordinating that that action, etc. So that's just an example that I could add to the mix um, if if um, individuals are interested in looking into that a little in a little more detail. Um, you can Google framework for resilient development in the Pacific, and you'll come up with the guiding document. Um, and um, and there's quite a lot of detail around um, what's happened there. Um, 
already along along those lines. And as a precursor to the um, to that framework, uh, Pacific Island countries have been um, engaged in joint adaptation and uh, disaster risk management planning for a number of years. And one of the uh, regional organizations has uh, put together a framework or a template for how to do that planning at the national level. So that's just a regional example that I'm familiar with. Thank you very much, Ms. Diego. We also have a question, uh, maybe. Thanks, Rosita, yeah. So we also have a question for Dr. Ismail um, that Rosita has asked. Dr. Ismail, are you still with us? Your video was turned on earlier. Right, so uh, Rosita has asked, I believe there are, th there were similar projects of AP in which focus on participatory aspects related to loss and damage. How does AP and focus on building resilience at the local level, especially related to climate risk, sorry, risk management in the capacity, in the work of capacity building, yes. All right. Um, so with APN capacity building um, project, uh, from uh, the list of projects that we had, um, one is uh, on the post-disaster recovery processes uh, on the flood affected communities in um, Cambodia and Fiji. And here, uh, wait. Uh, so the... Uh, just hold on. All right. Um, could I um get back to you later on on um this this uh topic um on the cap capacity building on the project of the APN? Sorry, there's <laughs> some glitches on on my screen right now. Sure, sure, sure. That's fine. Um, so Sorry, I. Sorry. I, I do believe there's another question for Ms. Siegel that was it has asked uh, on the work of risk management at the XCOM. Um, would you be able to answer that very quickly? Um, certainly, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, it, uh, well, uh, pub, uh, NGOs and, and other observer organizations may attend um, XCOM meetings. Um, generally, the, the um, expert group meetings are are limited to those experts on those groups, but the information coming out of those uh, group meetings is always published on the UNFCCC, um, and certainly input um, from civil society organizations and, and other observer organizations involved with the work of the UNFCCC. And I and I know that SLICAN is certainly um, the SLICAN Trust is that 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 there are ways of of um, of participating in in those activities, um, and 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 certainly even providing written inputs um, to the XCOM or to to their um, to their expert groups uh, through the secretariat. So I would I would propose that that would be the best way of of being involved um, and, and um, keeping up with what's coming out of that that expert group, but but also the other ex expert groups and and task forces under the XCOM, um, and and the the more you are involved um, personally as an observer, um, the the more likelihood there is of of actually um, being invited to participate in in future expert groups. So that would be my um, advice there. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, I think we will be wrapping up the questions. Thank you very much to everyone who submitted their questions. I think we will have group work now, so these questions can also be taken forward to uh, during the group work session. And before we lose any more participants, I would like to maybe encourage everyone to turn on the camera so we could do a group picture of all 54 who are on the call with us. Uh, just quickly turn on your cameras and we'll just do a say cheese and take a picture. Thank you. Great. Just a few more. Right. So everyone, you could give us your best smile and we'll take a few screenshots. Whoever's taking screenshots, please remember there's a page too as well. <laughs> and, right. Thank you very much um, for turning on your camera.
taking part in the picture. Uh, so we will open uh, the breakout rooms right now. So there will be two breakout groups, one for the international participants and one for Sri Lanka participants, so the discussions can be more focused. Um, you, there will be a moderator and a note taking each of the groups and kindly do appoint someone to report back when we come back to the main plenary in about 25 to 27 minutes. All right, thank you very much and see you soon.